All right, good evening again. All right, we're going to continue the series that Greg started last Sunday night. If you weren't here last Sunday night, we're going through a three-week series of Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. So if you've got your Bibles, please open up to Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to read through it again, starting in verse 9. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. And Jesus said, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, I just pray that you bless the reading of your word, God, and pray that you just give me the words to speak, Lord, I pray that you give us open ears, open eyes, and open hearts to receive your words tonight. Lord, we love you, and we thank you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right, so if you were here last week, Greg has come up with six principles about prayer. And last week he covered to start with adoration and worship. And then the second principle was to pray for wisdom and to submit. And today we're going to pick up and then we're going to cover the next two principles. And the third principle that we're going to cover is pray for provisions, both physical and spiritual. So we're going to take up where he left off last week. And the section of this verse, this is covered here. It starts in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. So what does that mean? Give us this day our daily bread. Praying for provisions, praying for physical provisions and spiritual provisions. We're pretty good at praying for physical provisions. As a matter, matter of fact, a lot of times that's all we use God for when we pray the majority of the time. You know, if we're not careful, we treat God like he's a genie in a magic lamp. When we go to him and we need something. God, I want this. God, I want that. God, help this person. God, help that person. God, do this. I feel sick. I don't want to feel sick anymore. Lord, please make me feel better. And we pray for things. We pray for stuff. And what we have to be careful when we pray for provisions is that we pray for what we need, not simply what we want. Like God wants to know what we want. He wants to know what's on our mind. It's okay to come to him and say, God, I want this. But at the same time, we have to be okay with hearing the word no. You don't need that right now. And if we look up a few verses before he, he gives the Lord's Prayer, he's talking to his disciples about how to pray. And he's telling them not to pray openly and boastfully like the, like the Sanhedrin did and the Pharisees did because they didn't want to... They wanted to be heard, and he says, don't use vain repetitions, repeating the same thing over and over. Like some people do think you pray 15 Hail Marys or 25 Our Fathers, and, and God's going to bless you because you repeated it so much. But he says, don't do this, for, in verse 8, be not like therefore unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you even ask him. So you've got to realize that God knows what you need before you even ask him. He knows what's necessary for you. So we pray for what we need and we pray for what our heart's desires. But at the same time, we must be okay with hearing, no, you don't need that. You know, we're like children. You know, God is our father and we're children of him. Well, at least I hope you are tonight. And a lot of times kids ask for things that the parents know they don't really need. Hey, daddy, I want this. Mom, I want that. And the wisdom of the Father says, you know what? Yeah, I know you want that. I know you really, really want it, but I know what's best for you. And I know that that's not really what you need. And maybe what you want, but what you need is this over here. And we have to be okay with, with hearing those answers from our loving Father. The best way I know how to pray for physical provisions in our life comes from Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9. And I want to read that to you. In Proverbs chapter 30, verses 8 and 9, the king here is praying. He says, God, there's two things that I require of you, two things that I ask for you. He says, number one, remove far from me vanity and lies. So help me to speak the truth. And the second thing is this. Listen to this. This is how we ought to pray for our provisions, our daily bread. The physical things that we need. He says, give me neither poverty nor riches. 
but feed me with the food that is convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. He says, I don't want to be poor, God. Don't give me property, but don't give me riches either. Because if I'm rich, I'll think I did it by myself. And he says, I will forget the Lord. And I will say, Who? Yeah, you'll forget that God blessed you with this. And you'll think that you work for it yourself and you just forget what he's done for you. But he says, also, don't let me fall into poverty because then I have to steal and I'll defy your name. And, I, you know, basically that word uh, deny or defile means to drag his name through the mud to misrepresent it. So he says, God, feed me with the food that is convenient for me. And that word convenient in that verse, the original Hebrew word, it has an idea of an allowance. My daily allowance, what you have allowed me to have, what God, what you have set aside for me, give that to me. Whatever you think that I deserve, that I need, give me that. Don't let me be poor. Don't let me be rich either. Just give me what I need. Give me what I need so I can make it through the day. God, give me what I need so I can make it, so I can take care of my family, so I can provide for my wife, so I can provide for my children, and so I can give to those who are in a worse shape than I am. And that's praying for physical provisions. And the second part is praying for spiritual provisions. Now, we oftentimes take a lot of focus on the physical and the things that we need. And we pray for, a lot of times we spend a lot of time praying for sick folk. And I was listening to Adrian Rogers the other day about what we pray for. Adrian Rogers, he was talking about all the things that we pray for. We spend most of our time praying for sick saints. We pray for six saints more than just about anybody else. When you look at the prayer list, the prayer list is, oh, pray for this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. Instead of praying for the things that, I want to say, are more necessary, but we pray for things in almost a selfish fashion. How often do we time, how much of our prayer time do we spend praying for those that are actually lost, those that don't, need, don't know the Lord? How often do we spend time praying for spiritual provisions to, for God to equip us to go out into the mission field and to win lost souls for Jesus Christ? So thinking about spiritual provisions, what we need from God to do the work that he has called us to do, I thought of three things. Three things that we need and three things that, that we often do pray for, but probably not in the way we should pray for them, or often not enough. So three spiritual provisions I would take from James chapter 1. The first one would be wisdom. James chapter 1 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. Which means, that word upbraideth means, he doesn't look at what you've done in the past. He doesn't judge you and hand you out wisdom according to how good you are, or how well you've done. He says, if you ask for wisdom, I'll give you wisdom. He gives to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. And we should be praying for wisdom. We need wisdom. I, mean, I, I pray for wisdom all the time because I, a lot of times my mouth works faster than my brain does. And I get myself in trouble. And if I was a little more wise with my words, I wouldn't get in as much trouble. We pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom to know when to do the right thing and, and when to say the right thing. And, and to stop ourselves before we say or do the wrong thing. And, and how to approach situations in life and how to approach people for Jesus Christ. And the second spiritual provision I think we should pray for is strength. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, is a great example of this. Uh, Paul is, is talking here, and he's saying that uh, he, he's describing a thorn in his flesh. And we all have a thorn in our flesh. Something that, that hurts us or hinders us or limits us in some way. And he says, I have this thorn in the flesh. And you, we can speculate on what his thorn was. And that's a, that's a whole different topic for a different time. And he says, I, I asked the Lord three times, God, take this away from me. God, take this away from me. But God's response, the Lord's response was, no, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my, for your, oh, no, let me say it right. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect. In weakness. So then Paul went on to say, I will rather glory in my weaknesses. I will rather glory in my infirmities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
And so we pray for strength, and a lot of times we get it backwards. We think that we need to be strong, and we need to come up with this strength in ourselves. But God says, no, you need to be weak so that I can be strong. So what we should pray for is that God's strength is revealed in our life. And that we submit to him, just like we talked about last week, that we bow down and submit to him and allow him to be strong in our weaknesses. And the third thing, wisdom, strength, the third thing I want to say is faith. One of my favorite lines in the whole Bible comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. In Mark 9, 23 and 24, there's this father who came to the disciples while Jesus was off doing something else. And he brought his son who was possessed by a demon. And the disciples couldn't cast him out. And it says that this child, he would tear himself and he would throw himself on the ground. He would do all these kind of things. And then Jesus walks up into this commotion. He's like, what's going on? And the dude talks to Jesus. He's like, I came to your disciples and they couldn't cast him out. Lord, is there anything that can be done for my son? And I love Jesus' response. Jesus looks at the Father and says, If you can only believe, all things are possible to them that believe. And then in verse 34, I love this. This is one of my favorite lines in all the Bible. It says, The Father cried out with tears streaming down his face. He said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. You know how powerful that is? You know what he's saying here? Jesus says, if you can believe, if you believe in me, I can, I can heal your son. And the father cries out, he's crying, he's weeping, and tears run down his face. He says, yes, Lord, I believe, I believe, but help my unbelief. Help my, that is a prayer that all of us need to be praying. Because a lot of times we act like, you know, we're good Christians and we got it all together and I believe in you. But we all struggle with unbelief from time to time. We all struggle with lack of faith. And if you say you don't, then you're probably lying. But he says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. How powerful of a prayer is that? I prayed that prayer for years because I know in my heart that as much as I have faith in God, there are times when my faith falters. There are times when my faith lacks. I said, Lord, I, I do believe you. I really do. And I know that you're the only begotten Son of God. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. I know you rose from the grave. But God, there's still some times that, that I need you to help my unbelief. I need you to strengthen my faith. So with our physical provisions met, our spiritual provisions of wisdom, strength, God's strength, God's wisdom and faith, then we're equipped to go out and do what we need to do. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me what I need today, God. You know, also in James it says that it's, you know, we shouldn't have our minds too focused too far into the future. That there's enough trouble in today to worry about today. So it's very apt that he says, give us this day our daily bread. Give me what I need right now, God. And we'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And he goes on and he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this. The, the next point is confess your sins and repent. And be careful because I'm going to trample over Greg's next point, which he's going to bring next week which is ask for forgiveness with a forgiving heart. But this point we're going to talk about this week is confess your sins and repent. He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And I just want to touch on this real quick. Like I said, I don't want to go too far into the next point. But he says a little further down in verse 15, that if you forgive not men their trespasses, Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. You know what he's saying? He says, you want to be forgiven. But if you will not forgive others their trespasses, their sins, their wrongdoings against you, then God will not forgive your wrongdoings against him. That is a really, really frightening statement. That is frightening. So what we can gather from that just quickly is that unforgiveness is a very dangerous place to be. 
Matter of fact, I would say that if you as a person, I think from this we can draw this conclusion, that if you are a person who refuses to forgive and continually holds unforgiveness in your heart and refuses to let it go, that it may be a sign that you're not truly forgiven yourself. Because he says, if you are going to be forgiven, you've got to forgive others. And if you have been forgiven, then surely you will forgive others. So to put it as Brother Clinton Heron so eloquently puts it, if that's you, you may not have got what you thought you got when you thought you got it. So you better check what you got. But confess your sins and repent. Lord, forgive us our sins. Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our trespasses. It's all three ways of saying the same thing. It's repentance. Now, what does repentance mean? Somebody tell me, what does repentance mean? To turn around. Okay? There's actually two words in the Bible where we get the word repentance from. There's a Hebrew word and there's a Greek word. Now, the Hebrew word means exactly that, to turn around. The Hebrew word is shub, S-H-U-B. And it literally means to do an about face, to turn around. You're going one, down one path, and you stop, and you go the opposite direction. So when we ask for forgiveness, that, that's what repentance is. See, repentance is not simply an apology. Oh, God, I'm sorry for doing that. Lord, forgive me. My wife likes to say, because I've done this before, I'll say, I'm sorry for something, Lord. I'll say, honey, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I did that. And she will say, if you were sorry, you wouldn't have done it. <laughs> if you were sorry, you'll stop doing it. So repentance is not simply an apology. Oh, you can say, I'm sorry for anything. But if you're really sorry, you'll stop doing it. That's what repentance is. It's a turning around. It's a complete about face. You are going this way, and God gets a hold of you, and you realize that you're going down the wrong path. You're following yourself. You are your own God, and you're headed to hell, and you turn around, and you follow him. But then there's another word for repentance, and it's the word that Jesus uses in the Greek in Matthew, and it's the, the Greek word is um, metaneote. And it literally means to have a new mind. Metaneo, new mind. And it reminds me of, of what Paul says in Romans. In Romans chapter 1, he says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So if you truly repent, if you truly turn and follow him, then your way of thinking is going to be different. You're not going to think the same things you used to think. You're not going to want the thing, same things that you used to want. Now, those old sinful desires and those old sinful things, they creep up from time to time. Amen? We all get tempted and we all get tried to be drawn away to the old man or the old woman. But it says to repent means to have a new mind. Uh, old preacher I grew up under, he put it this way. He says, God changes your wanted to. You wanted to. Well, what does that mean? Well, what I want to do. I want to do this. And I want to do that. And I want to do the other. And I want to do what I want to do. When you get saved, when you truly repent, God changes that. You want to serve Him. You want to be close to Him. You want to have a relationship with Him. And if you don't, if you don't want to be close to Him, if you don't want to serve Him, if you don't want to spend time talking with him, if you don't want that close walk, that close relationship with him, then what does that say about you? What does that say about your relationship with him? You see, prayer, and we're going to close, we're going to spend a few minutes praying, just like we did last week. Prayer is where we get to, we get the privilege, the greatest Christian privilege that we have is being able to. Come to our God and speak to him at any time we want. And he hears us. Now, if I woke up and my wife, was, if my wife woke up and, we were get, and she was going off to school and I was getting ready. And she said, bye, baby, I love you. Hope you have a great day. And I said nothing to her. And she walked out the door. Then she texts me throughout the day and says, hey, how's your day going? What you doing? How, you, know, you up at church? What you da, 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 da. And I just leave her unread all day long. 
And then she calls me as she's coming home from school to try to check on me, see what's going on, and I just don't answer. Then I get home, and, and she speaks to me, hey, how was your day? And I don't say anything. Hey, what you want for supper? You want me to cook you something? And I don't say a word. Hey, what's going on? What's wrong? Let's fix this. What's, what's going on? And I just flat out refuse to speak to her. And then we lay down in the same bed at night, and she tries to tell me good night, and I, and I just roll over and face the other way. What kind of relationship is that? It's not a relationship. But God wants to be close to us. God wants to have a relationship with us. And how often do we treat him that way? That we come to him a few times a week, and we say, hey, I need this, I need that, I need that. I need that. Okay, bye. I'll talk to you later. I'll talk to you again when I need something else. And the prayer, the, the time of prayer that we have is the opportunity to have a conversation with God. To strengthen that relationship. To build that bond that we have with Him. It is our greatest Christian privilege. It is also our greatest Christian failure. We have a God that wants to have a relationship with us. Let me tell you something. We pray for all these things and all these different principles. As Brother Greg said last week, it's a true statement. If you're trying to serve the Lord, and you're trying to strive to be the Christian, the man and the woman he's called you to be, and your prayer life isn't right, then nothing else will be right either. So we're going to take a few moments. And they're going to come up here, or they're going to play some music while this altar is open. And we're just going to spend a few moments talking to the Lord. And I'd ask you to pray those prayers that we talked about tonight. Ask God for what you need. Ask Him to help you be satisfied with your daily bread, the allowance that He's given to you. Pray the same prayer that the man with the demoniac son prayed. Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Confess your sins to him. And this would be my suggestion to you. Sometimes I simply say, God, I know what I do wrong. I know what my, where I mess up. Sometimes I, I get done talking to him and I say, God, if there's anything else where I'm failing you, then reveal it to me so I can change that too. So we're going to spend a few moments just praying. This altar is going to be open. I ask you to come down as I play some music.